I want to tell you about an important partner of Silicon Slopes and somebody you all should be using. It's LifeBrand. LifeBrand empowers all social media users to create a meaningful personal brand and reach their full potential through AI-powered cleaning technologies and nationally accredited social media courses. You must get engaged with LifeBrand. It's at lifebrand.life, lifebrand.life. If you care at all about your reputation, go to lifebrand.life. Thank you, LifeBrand, for supporting Silicon Slopes. Stay in control of your online reputation. Visit lifebrand.life today. So you're doing a lot of things, Jefferson. Yeah. Like you do, like, let's start with maybe the most impressive thing, although I don't know, you tell me. Hmm. You're an elected official and not, and you're in-house leadership. I, I guess if you say that's impressive. <laughs> that's, uh, well, who in their right mind would put themselves up <laughs> yeah. to get involved in politics? And the courage that it takes to actually do that and to serve is unbelievable. I, I mean, I, I'm sure you get a lot of criticism and, you know, all that type of stuff just for being in that arena and for no other reason, right? Like, yeah. it's pretty, it's actually pretty impressive to me, at least, as somebody who would not do that. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right? Just because, my word, it feels like so thankless, but it, I mean, you really are doing like a public service. So mm -hmm. uh, what's your role in the house now? Yeah, House Majority Leader. So you're like number two. You're like the next speaker. Yeah. So my job's, yeah. I kind of jokingly say, to herd cats, but our job's really to try to bring everyone together. How do we get stuff done? Yep. And our current speaker is Mike Schultz. Correct. And this is his first session of speaker, right? Mm -hmm. um, what can we expect this session? Yeah. We've been laying out uh, for the last week some of the caucus priorities of things that we're really interested in uh, pursuing this year. Um, uh, we actually spent over the interim, so after last session, uh, we actually had the most robust, inclusive discussion we've ever had around what is it that really matters to the state in preparation for the session. Mm -hmm. So we had eight or nine different meetings with our, with our chairs of each of our sub-appropriation and subcommittees to talk about what are the things that you're hearing the most about from your constituents, what are the things that you've, you know, within your committees that you're talking about. So we put that together uh, kind of put together kind of a rough draft of what that would look like. And then we took it back to the whole caucus and said, okay, does this align? A number of other ideas came up that, uh, you know, tied into or supported those efforts. So, I mean, it's things that you would normally expect. I mean, we're really focused on some key areas mm -hmm. this year. Um, families are very important. We're always looking for ways to help support families, being a family friendly state with that also comes in with businesses, right? How do we make right. sure that we're providing the right environment that businesses can thrive and so some of that's you know making sure government's lean and efficient and 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 how do we make sure we're cutting waste and and even putting more uh providing returns back to the state taxpayers and yeah. giving them tax cuts and things like that so that's one of the areas that we're really focusing on um the main things you also will hear a lot about water is a huge deal as we know in the state so looking at ways that we can be more collaborative uh, across the state and how do we do better conservation how do we make sure we're all communicating. I mean, those are mm -hmm. challenges that you have. Um, I would say energy is a huge deal this year. We're going to be talking a lot about energy, um, making sure that Utah is continuing to really do all of the above mm -hmm. and, and driving innovation, but also protecting, pushing back against some of the overregulation that we're seeing um, to make sure that our citizens can continue to have affordable, reliable, dispatchable energy. It's yeah. a big deal for us. Um, so those are going to be some of education is always a huge priority for us. Yeah. We'll continue to be. What do you think, like, um, you, so you work in higher ed, too, Correct. right? Like, you work at UVU. I mean, you have so many titles. <laughs> it's crazy. You've got to be the business man I know. Um, what do you think about all this discussion recently, and even the governor has talked about it, around, like, DEI efforts, DEI in um, universities, DEI in, you know, government programs and schools and education, all that type of stuff. And I'll set this up because I don't want to get – yeah, controversial here. Um, it's not clear what DEI means. I think it has a different de definition. Like what diversity means to me mm -hmm. and you might be different for what it means to somebody else. Equity, for sure. Sure. 
yeah. that's that's probably the most controversial one. If, if I was like leading that group, I'd be like, hey, yeah. that's the one you really need to focus on because mm-hmm. um, equality of outcome is a bad idea. Mm-hmm. Equality of opportunity is a great idea. Yep. But if it's equality of outcome, my word, that's mm-hmm. a terrible. Like that, that's been tried and it's it's really awful. Mm-hmm. And then inclusion, like that's pretty open ended. Who knows, you know? But what do you think of this? Like this is a, you, and I'm sure there'll be bills and stuff uh, oh, yeah. around yeah. this. Um, you know, I actually work for the the system of higher education now. So I was at UVU for five years, and and then with my new role, I've moved into the system. Oh, but okay. I'm heavily yeah. involved in education, and um, you know, I loved being at UVU. One of the things I loved about it, I actually went there five years before I took a job there as a volunteer. Uh, Matt, President Holland at the time asked me to come and uh, take a look at their endowment and just said, that was my professional background. I did do investments yeah. and just said, Hey, can you come and look at uh, what we're doing and tell us if we're doing the right thing? And my first reaction was, no, that's not how you should be managing it. <laughs> and I gave him some feedback don't ever do that because then the next question was great. Can you come help us? <laughs> and so then I turned into a, you know, full-time, not full-time, but part-time volunteer helping to run that endowment. And so that was my first interaction with higher education. Um, I hadn't done anything with higher ed before. And what I loved about the message at UVU, we always heard about it. And Matt Holland very much was a big advocate for this was making sure that everyone felt welcome. Everybody felt like they belonged and then especially focusing on those that were first generation, for those that had never had an opportunity to go to college, to help them see that they can, there's a path for them, that they can come in and be, you know, get those skills and better their lives. Right. And so that was my background when I actually, uh, I ended up coming on full time at UVU and um, I actually launched two different programs there. And one of the programs I launched was the Student uh, Wolverine Fund, a Student Venture Capital yeah, Fund. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that very well. And uh, what I loved is I got to work really closely with these students. And, and I remember the first year we launched that program, um, I had you know a fairly good group of different students, different backgrounds, uh, but we went to a competition. And it was this national competition that all these schools, all the Ivy League schools came, and we had three of our students that were first generation. Never, no parent had ever gone to college. And the one who had actually dropped out of college uh, or out of high school and then ended up yeah. getting on, you know, getting the GED and came to, to UVU. But we went out to this competition and, and our students and I would put them up against anybody. We ended up taking second in the nation. We beat out all these top Ivy League schools and nobody had a clue who UVU yeah. was, right? But what I loved about that experience is that we created opportunities that somebody would have never had before. And, and because we gave them those chances, I think when we talk about this discussion, I think the the verbiage has kind of gone a little bit beyond what I think the real intent was, which was how do we create an environment that everybody feels welcome, included. Um, yeah. We help students that come from all walks of life. Now, you may be whatever your background is. Uh, you know, I, I often hear now that, you know, you go to some of these college campuses and if you're conservative you're felt you feel very discriminated against and i know that some people would laugh when they hear that no it's true but, but you yeah. want to be able to, whatever your background is right yeah. uh, whatever your whatever your race whatever your gender whatever your preferences are all of those you should feel safe in school and i think the problem is we've kind of allowed what was originally really well-intentioned good things has kind of shifted a little bit and i uh, you made the comment which i appreciate it is focusing a little bit more around equal outcomes. Mm-hmm. And I think what we'd like to see is put that focus back on equal opportunity. Everybody should have an opportunity. And then also making sure that no matter what your background is, you feel safe and comfortable attending a university, attending a mm-hmm. state college, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, so that's really the focus. And I think you'll see that in the bill. It's, it's, not, it's not saying we're going to completely get rid of this. We actually want to take funding and, and look at putting it more focusing around what the original intent, which was student success, helping lift for those demographics that don't traditionally have access to higher education. How do we really make them uh, feel welcome and supported? Uh, yeah. and, and that's what, really what we're trying to do. And it's not just education that's going through this, by the way. I mean, uh, Boeing, yeah. and you're seeing all this stuff about airlines and um, DEI, and they're actually calling it DIE, which is, mm-hmm. which is kind of funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the goal of it, as you just described, it's fantastic. Hey, we just want everybody to feel welcome, included. Everybody matters. No one matters more than anyone else. That type mm-hmm. of a mindset, right? And it does seem like it may have gotten a little bit the opposite of that. It may like have been doing exactly what it wasn't intended to do, which yeah. is being exclusionary. Yeah. And focused on like, hey, we're going to help this group over this group for X reason. Mm-hmm. 
and hopefully get Y outcome. It's just like this really interesting discussion and, and like it's fascinating that it comes um that it's coming to this this forefront. I mean you you've had two university presidents resign recently mm -hmm. over like I would say it's it's somewhere around this realm. Like they wouldn't condemn uh the attacks because they didn't want to offend some groups on the camp like it's really an, yeah. it's an interesting time in our world and we're going up into an election year here i just wonder how you feel like man it feels hot out there it feels really yeah, hot. yeah yeah and i don't know on the president's resigning for those purposes but it has been a topic of well one was like yeah. plagiarism and one was oh you're talking at the national level yeah yeah, 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 yeah. not not ours okay not yeah ours. <laughs> i'm talking about harvard yeah and, yeah yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. was it pen pens yes yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah, you're not right. ours. i was like yeah no but um no it is it is and i'm hoping i mean i'm a, a huge advocate for for public education higher education um, and, and I think what, what I think a lot of people feel is, can we just take some of that, and I hate to say this, but the politics out of it, can we get back to focusing on what's the core reason that we want to be in college? We didn't want to go there. We want to be open to all ideas. We want to get, you know, you're kind of building your identity, mm -hmm. you're learning all these different things, but they shouldn't feel like they're pushed to believe a certain way yeah. or to be a certain way. And so I think on the political side, that's part of it. And then on the you know, when you're dealing with race and issues like that, you know, I, I think there's still a strong desire to make sure we still create environments where they feel welcomed, but but not create the divide, right? Not to single out and say, you belong to this group or you belong to this group. We just need to get that humanity back, mm -hmm. right? Make everyone feel like we're all part of the same you know human what? race. Martin Luther King was right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Look, I, I don't think we need to build uh, or change that philosophy. I think Martin Luther King is, the way he described it, that's how we should do it. We shouldn't go beyond that. Yeah. Because then it becomes like this. It's not even like reverse racism. It's actually just racism. Because I, I think like reverse racism is an interesting term, but because mm -hmm. um, it's just racist. <laughs> At the end of the day, yeah. And and not just like bigotry. If you're a certain religion, if you're a certain like all this type of stuff, right? Like let's just yeah, we're all just one human race. No one matters more than you, and you don't matter more than anybody else. And mm -hmm. live by that philosophy, and I think I think we'll be good. Yep, I love that. <laughs> it's yeah. a great philosophy. Um. So for, for this future of Utah, though, I know that there's probably two camps in this state, and I hear it a lot, and I bet you hear it a lot more, around like, hey, this growth is out of control. Let's yeah. stop this growth. This is too much. This mm -hmm. isn't the Utah that we grew up in. This isn't the Utah that our grandpas loved or, you know, like even our dads and all, you know, um, other generations. Let's stop it. And then there's the other group which probably a lot of people in Silicon Slopes are, which is like, hey, let's just build this thing and just keep going and keep going. and co Where's the mm -hmm. middle ground there? And how do we figure that out? Because I don't know where you stand on this, but I think growth is probably the biggest issue over yeah, the next always, 20, 30 yeah. years around like the future of Utah and how it's managed. And you're a part of um, the point of the mountain yep. leading up the innovation stuff there. What do you think? Like, how are we doing on this so far? And what would you change? And what, what do you have? What message do you have for these two camps? Yeah, again, uh, not an easy problem to solve, as you know. Yeah. Um, we are very lucky that we live in a state that has the economy that we have. And I, I attribute a lot of that to the wonderful people in your world, in Silicon Slopes, that are the reason that we're seeing so much of the success. Of course, we've got a very well-diversified economy oh, here. Yeah, yeah. A lot of other great industries uh, that are that are really taken off, but but our tech sector is doing phenomenal. Um, it's tough, right? Because we want to make sure that we 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 still continue to be a driver, a leader. We want to be a, a great place for business to be. And ten and twenty years from now, I still believe that's absolutely critical for our state. Uh, managing growth is is a tough one, right? And we, as I talked about earlier, some of the main priorities we've had for the last several years. Uh, particularly have been focusing around how do we manage growth. Uh, transportation is a huge part of that, obviously. And and I'm grateful that we live in a state where we had these large surpluses. And rather than mm -hmm. just going and spending them on whatever, you know, try to make certain groups happy, we actually took a lot of that off the top and said we need to continue to build infrastructure to make sure that we can continue to, to, to keep this train yeah. going, right? Um, on, on water is another huge one. You know, that is another limiting factor of the growth is making sure that we can provide the water for our residents. Um, what we did with the secondary metering two years ago really was around that. I saw in my city alone when we implemented it, we were one of the first cities to implement it. Uh, we cut our consumption about 20 to 30% just by metering and, and tiering the water. Yeah. So those are things that I think we have to do to be able to manage the growth. 
In terms of the two camps, you know, I do kind of love the fact that we have a local, I was a city council member once upon a time, and um, I do love the fact that cities have the ability to be able to make some of those decisions and, yeah. and, and be able to decide that. And I know that that's sometimes a controversial thing. We do have a NIMBY mentality a lot of times. Absolutely. Uh, but we also have communities that are saying, hey, we're okay with that. We're, there, you know, we're doing TODs and other things that I think are creating the right structure around having housing that, that, that will meet the needs of growth around transit, which is, I think, the most important thing for that demographic that may not have access to a vehicle. Yeah. So I think as we're thinking about smart growth, we're working with the League of Cities and Towns, with UAC, the, the Association of Counties, and how can we continue to manage this the right way um, and not just let it go crazy? And not to make those who love Utah as it is now or how, how it's been feel alienated or attacked, right? I think that's a really interesting piece of this. I actually see it from both sides. Like I... And my grandpa owned a farm here. My grandpa would have hated all that. <laughs> right? Like, and so, like, uh, you know, the, the Utah that he grew up in and lived and helped build isn't what it is now. And so I see that side, actually, yeah. and most of my family's probably still in that camp. And then, you know, obviously, through my role in Silicon Slopes, I see, like, hey, let's, you know, make Utah the number one economy in the country, mm-hmm. make it the best place to live, work build a company, have a family, all that type of stuff. I think all that's really great. There's an interesting balance Mm -hmm. here. And I don't, I actually, you're in an interesting spot too, because then you got to factor in what role does government even play in any of this, Mm -hmm. right? And we like to be light touch, right? We don't love a lot of government. So we're trying to look at ways to help in streamlining the process of dealing with the growth and dealing with ways you know, that we're, we're managing that, yeah. um, providing the right infrastructure needs, as I mentioned. So we'll continue to invest in that. But yeah, outside of that, I think it really, the market should be driving that and our local community should be the ones that really get to make the majority of those types of decisions. Yeah, I like that approach. What about this? Uh, Governor Cox came out recently. Sorry, I'm just throwing you things that no, might good. get you in hot water. I don't know. <laughs> uh, he came out recently around this, um, let's abolish the in- income tax. I actually like that idea. On, I, I, I don't know, know enough had. about it. <laughs> I don't know enough about yeah. like whether that's good or not. I just know like for <laughs> states like Texas mm-hmm. and Florida and Nevada, it's worked really well. Yeah. And it's been like a really good thing to drive workers and things like that. I don't know if it's a good idea for Utah or not. I have no idea. But but yeah, he came out and said like, hey, I, I think it'd be great to just completely get rid of the income tax. Yeah. What would that be like? I mean, can we do stuff like this in 2024? Can we do big things uh, big changes without like total revolt. I remember like Derek Miller was getting uh, protested for holding a board meeting around like the, um, what was that thing? The the airport and, oh. and all that type of stuff. Mm. Like it's, we're, it's an interesting time. I don't know. Like, I don't know like if you can do stuff like that. Yeah. So there's a couple factors there. I, I would say the state very much agrees that we need a more, we, we call it a three-legged stool, right? That what we control in terms of tax revenues. Um, property tax, income tax, and sales tax. And, and and a lot of states are moving that way. What what you'll find in states that have very low income tax also have much higher property tax. Mm-hmm. And so they just make it up in other ways. And and I think the income tax is hated. I also think when people move to states that have high property tax, they also hate that too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. So, uh, But we have been moving to shift more away from using that. The challenge we have, of course, is that Utah is... Uh, one of the few states that actually the primary uh, use of those funds is education. Mm -hmm. So unless you shift that tax burden to the property tax owners, um, that really would have a negative effect on on public education. So we've been looking at ways to continue to reduce that. One of the things that Governor uh, Huntsman did back in the day is he said, look, we can either take a pie that's this size or we can lower the tax rate and actually see better, uh, you know, grow the pie and we're going to have a maybe a smaller piece, but of a bigger pie. Right. And so that's what we've seen and we've been trying to do is is ultimately, yes, it may have a little bit of a negative effect on the short term in terms of the revenue. But by continuing to get more aggressive in the in the income tax, we actually think it'll help drive more success on the business side, which, again, will grow the economy and will be able to provide more funding for public education in the long run. So but shifting to, from from one source to another, I think we're moving that way, but it's it's going to be yeah. tough. We're probably top 10, 15 in the country on income tax rate. We're the highest in our Intermountain area. And yet we're 42nd or 43rd on property tax. Um, and yeah. so you already see an imbalance there. And I'm not saying we need to go out and raise property tax tomorrow, but but that's there's somehow going to have to be some of that. Or like what we're trying to do, just continue to see if we can cut incrementally down. And I know that's the 
the the goal of the governor, the speaker, and the president is to continue to cut that, get that rate lower yeah. on the income tax side. When uh, like on the you said like uh, most of that goes to education, doesn't it have to? Yeah, Isn't currently like it's a, constitutionally required. That's yeah. a con- like that could be overturned and like, but yeah, not amendment. overturned, but you guys yeah. could vote and say, hey, let's not do that anymore or something like that. Well, that's that's actually on the ballot this year of 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 the earmark, right? Right now, the earmark requires that that goes, and we would, uh, you know, we think that there's actually some benefit. Interestingly, for public education, the income tax is is also the most volatile. Mm-hmm. And and so yeah. it's great in good times, but it's also not great in in you know recession periods where public education gets hit really hard. We'd like to see a little more balanced approach to that. So um, there is a is a ballot initiative or a, it's an amendment this year that would actually open that up to be able to say that we can we can rely on all sources of revenue and not just focus on this one. I think that'll actually help in the long run with public education. It also is tied into um, the property tax or the sales tax on food. So removing that is also part of the ballot initiative that will be on this this session. How do you think Governor Cox is doing? I I think he's great. Um, I'll just say this. He has been really good to work with. Um, When I got in the legislature, there was always this kind of, and I think there's a healthy tension, right? We need that between the House, Senate, and and the governor. Um, That's the checks and balances that we need. Um, But I feel like Governor Cox has really made an effort to work with us a lot more closely as we're developing out policy ideas. There's always this joke that the legislature takes the budget and you know, mm-hmm. the governor's budget and throws it in the trash. I would say in, in, in our case, we're doing a lot more collaboratively. And as a result, I think our priorities are more aligned and we actually do uh, care a lot more when the governor's budget comes out mm-hmm. because we've been working together on a lot of those policy initiatives. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's, what do you think? And, and I'll stop with the political questions here. That's in a good. Second, I don't but mind. we're in the middle of political season now. Yeah. Okay. Is it Iowa caucuses like Monday or yeah. something like that? It's about to get crazy. This could be a really crazy year. Oh yeah. Um, what do you think about the race for Mitt Romney's seat? You've got John Curtis, Brad Wilson, mm-hmm. the uh, mayor guy. So, so sorry, I don't know his name. Yeah, from Richfield. Yeah. Um, and and a, and a few others vying for that. Um, which will then open up John's seat mm-hmm. uh, in the third congressional district, and you've got you know a race for governor. You've got all these mm-hmm. like things going on. What do you think? How are we? How does that all land? What is your opinion on it? I guess. Yeah, you know, well, I'll just give you the most blanket. It, it, and it's always interesting on these situations where you have multiple good friends in the race, right? I have several that are really close friends of mine. Um, that I think are amazing. Uh, John Curtis, I think, has been a really good member of Congress. Um, but I also worked very, very closely with Brad Wilson. Mm-hmm. He was the one that actually put me on his leadership team when I first came into the legislature. And um, so I have a lot of respect for for Brad, and I've supported Brad um, in this race because I, I have watched him be a real leader. And, yeah. and I think a lot of the things that we're seeing that have been uh, doing well from the government side, again, I'd we don't ever attribute the success in the state to the government, but sometimes it's actually what we don't do that helps our state, right? Staying out of yeah. people's lives. But, but, but Brad, as a speaker, was always so focused around how do we ensure that our state continues to be the best state in 10 and 20 years? And he was always focusing. He was always planning. And how do we continue to make sure? And he called them the big gears. You know, these things I just talked about. And it was like, we just got to keep focusing on these. And so I've just seen him in that capacity and he just did such an amazing job. So obviously I'm partial to him because he's not only a good friend, but he was a a great speaker. Uh, But it's hard again because John's just an awesome guy. And I don't know the others in the race. I know there's a couple others that have jumped in. I know I I should say that I know some of them personally, but I haven't worked with them as closely. And I know the governor has a few primary opponents. Yes. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, quite a few. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? There's a lot. I of think them? there's several that are in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, that's pretty common. Really? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Um, I want to talk to you about the Utah Innovation Fund. Yeah. And it was something that was announced recently. Tell us about it. You're heading it up. What is this going to do for the state of Utah? Yeah. So <clears throat> this really came um, when I got the job at the point. I don't do anything with the land piece of it. I've been working in higher education, as, as we talked about. Um, but when the original uh, structure was set up, they really uh, made the decision early on that we really want higher education to play an active role in this. When you think about innovation, a lot of that's coming out of research. It's students, workforce. You know, So much of that has a some kind of a nexus to higher education. And so um, I actually was interested. I was not looking for this job. I was in the process of raising a venture capital fund. Really? Uh, yeah, that was my my background, my passion. And so I was actually looking at that. And I had several people approach me and say, hey, you've got the perfect mix of skills for this. 
Um, you know, we need somebody who's been in higher education, who's an innovator, uh, worked in venture capital. I've built and sold companies. So mm-hmm. it was like, we need somebody that gets this, but also knows how to, you know, deal with all the government stuff that we're working through. Um, but I went around all over the world. Look, you know, when I first got this job, I was looking at the top innovation ecosystems in, in the world. And one of the things that we, that I found and others that were with me in this process um, found was that there was always some kind of a gap fund that was really helping get that first that first investment piece. And you've been in this space, so you understand this, but that really early capital that, that really VCs are not, you know, mm-hmm. they've got to return money to their investors. They always tend to move upstream. Once you get a successful fund, it's like, well, if I go make that fund twice as lo- at large, I can get more management fee and mm-hmm. all these things. And so it's really hard to keep that, that first gap funding in the in, in the ecosystem especially when it comes to more deep tech type things and when you're looking at stuff that's spinning out of university you're looking you know 10 15 year time horizons and so and i had a large group there's about 30 or 40 of us that were working on this when we identified those things that had been happening around we said we, we really need to do something like that in utah it just so happened to coincide as we were thinking about that uh, that we had some surplus some of the earnings yeah. off of the fund of funds and, and which is great because the fund of funds actually never used taxpayer dollars. It was backed by the state of Utah, yeah. but they went out and did it privately. That was a big, I want to shout out Rich Nelson, the oh, yeah. Utah Tech Council. Uh, that was a big part of his tenure there. Mm-hmm. And um, he, he did a lot of great work there. He really did. And, and I know Jeremy Nelson ran that for a while yeah. and had a big role in that. Um, but, but so we identified at the time when we were dealing with the fund of funds and what should we do with some of those earnings that have come off of it. And, and rather than just spending them, we said, well, where are the gaps in the capital ecosystem in Utah? And that just so happened to coincide with when we were looking at these innovation districts. And so we, that's when we came together with this concept around the Utah Innovation Fund. Um, Representative Sanquist was the one that ran the bill with Senator Milner. And, and the whole point of it, we set aside $15 million is to be that first gap fund just to, to be able to help mm-hmm. these companies that you know we'll look at student one of their first deal that we looked at actually was a student that came out of utah tech and had a desalination technology that actually could really significantly improve the outcomes of desalination desalination and and so the fact that it was solving a big problem that's part of the fund is we want to do big impact like what mm-hmm. are things that really are going to benefit the state potentially benefit the nation um also looking at, you know, it still has to go through all the traditional vetting. We put it through a very rigorous process. We have a team of analysts that look through this and, and really make sure that along the way that it's sustainable, that there's really a market opportunity there. But then we go and try to connect the company with other investors. And right now the challenge in Utah is we don't have a lot of investors in the deep tech space. I think that's going to change. Yeah. I think we're going to see more and more in here. But so a lot of what we try to do is not just give a little bit of capital, but connect them with venture capital firms around the country, even the world, yeah. that are willing to put capital in at that early stage in that space. Are you finding that there's a lot of VC firms around the world that want to invest in Utah? It's amazing to me. And I, I saw know. this for the first time when I was right out of business school. I was in San Francisco and I worked with a lot of venture funds out there in 2009. And even then I would talk to, you know, partners at big funds and they'd all say, oh, we love Utah. It's an up and coming. At the time, they weren't quite ready to put a lot of mm-hmm. resources in, right? It was still, they like to do it within an hour distance, as you know, uh, but they started to partner with some of the local funds. But at the time, we didn't really have a rich ecosystem. Um, I think that's where we're going to be at with the deep tech space. I think we're starting to put ourselves on the map in life sciences and aerospace and defense. You're yeah. seeing a lot of these things, energy. Utah is becoming more and more of a, of a cluster for those. So I think that's coming, but right now it's still pretty much in its infancy. Yeah. But but is the desire there? Yeah. I've I've traveled on trade missions around the world with the governor, and I can't tell you how many times they'll say, "We're really interested in what you're doing there. Please let us know. Please keep us in the loop on anything that you think's interesting." Yeah. Yeah. We are becoming huge in aerospace and defense. I mean, we already yeah. are pretty big there, and what's happening up in Ogden and the, that area is just incredible. Yeah. Um, what about AI? Mm-hmm. Will you guys invest in artificial intelligence? Yes. That's deep mm-hmm. tech. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts on AI and its potential to destroy humanity or not? <laughs> well, funny you ask, because I've been involved in uh, the policy that we're creating for AI uh, this whole this whole year since the session. Senator Colomer and I, um, right after the session, started a working group, and we've been meeting uh, at least monthly all through the interim. 
um, and and trying to say what what is the right role for the state. We're a very light touch state. We want to be pro business, but at the same time, we do think there's some concerns. And so, what you'll see in this legislation, I'm I can't go into total detail because sure. it's still being finished, but. You're really looking at some of the hard do not do's, right? Some of the things like deep fakes and some of the fraud that we're seeing and, 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 and also making sure that if somebody creates AI and it does harm, they're still liable, right? Just because it's created by someone else, yeah. you at the end of the day, there needs to be somebody that has some responsibility for that. So that's part of it. But the other side of it is really we want to we wanna actually develop a, almost like a, a beta testing laboratory, partnering with our with our Department of Commerce and, and really kind of learning as we go, because we just don't know. We know there's incredible opportunity, but we don't know what the next thing is and what yeah. the potential impact could be. So looking for a way to, to really work with companies as they're developing out these technologies to make sure that they're not doing harm, but also supporting uh, the fact that, you know, we want to see them here. We want to see Utah be a leader in this space but also making sure that we're protecting uh, the citizens. The other element of that that I'm working on is a data privacy bill. And part of the concern, obviously, with, with AI is how much data they're gathering and scraping. And, Particularly copyright and oh, yeah, the, the data yes. itself. Yeah, data privacy and also just c- copyright. That that New York Times versus OpenAI case is going to be fascinating. Uh, super interesting what the decision is there. Yeah, so we'll be doing some things, on, especially on the government privacy, uh, data privacy that we'll be working on. Um, we will touch a little bit into the consumer privacy, but that's another thing. We're wanting to give safeguards for the citizens, but at the same time, realizing there's incredible opportunity with AI. Yeah, I don't really understand. I, I've said this before on this podcast, but I don't really understand the um, whole AI is going to kill us all. Nobody ever explains how, Yeah. right? Because it's just code. Right. Like, and maybe it is like possible. I mean, p- people really smart and smarter than me think it is, but I don't, I have never had a really good answer of how that yeah. will happen. Mm-hmm. Right now, it's just like, hey, we'll do like some work that you don't have to do anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it has a huge opportunity. I mean, you think about education, healthcare, and there's so many things where this could really, I mean, just efficiencies, yeah. right? Coding, you know, how much you could do legal. There's so many opportunities there. Um, and those, to your point, are not things that are going to, you know, yeah. severely impact us, it's going to affect our workforce. And we've actually got another working group under Talent Ready Utah that is really focusing around how is AI going to impact the workforce? What jobs are going to be you know, negatively impact? How can we help transition people or get people aware of the, the potential for AI? And, and then all these industries in some way are leveraging AI. So how do we get everybody a little more exposure? This is part of what we're trying to do with the computer science mm-hmm. initiative. Um, I ran the bill last year to expand that, get full, get ongoing funding. But we need to do more even in our K-12 and higher education around what the potential of AI is going to be and how does that, you know, how, do, how can these students have the skills to be able to use that? And regardless, it could be manufacturing. Um, any, right. Every industry is going to have an impact by it. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. What's going on at the Point of Mountain? Yeah, so that's really exciting. So they've they uh, the the Palmslets, the the Point of the Mountain Land Authority, they uh, went through a very rigorous process of selecting a developer. Uh, that developer was chosen about a year ago. Um, they just went through this again very rigorous process, working through the development agreement. They finalized that a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was about a month ago, and um, they're actually now at the point where they're starting to uh, you know they've been tearing down the buildings. They're looking at building the infrastructure. The state put some support behind the infrastructure so providing a loan it was actually it's going to be paid back but um, to be able to start the infrastructure so that's in process Um, the thing that i'm really working on is we're building at the very heart of that and and this was something also i learned when i went around uh, looking at all these other innovation districts you needed kind of the heart the pulse the 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 core for innovation and and so we're actually building right in the middle of that it's called convergence hall and it's going to be similar to like a Lassonde uh, yeah. that's going to have, you know, student housing at the top. Uh, but it's really going to be a place where we can bring everyone together, They're working with all the institutions across the state, both our universities, our colleges, our technical colleges, um, to be able to, to use that space, to be able to work together, but also building labs, uh, partnering with industry, yeah. doing projects um, we'll have makerspace, prototyping, all of that. Are you doing that through the University of Utah? or uh, No, this it? is actually going through the whole system. So, oh, I so see. I, my job is actually directly with the UCHI system. Oh, okay. So the state actually owns the building, uh, but UCHI is going to be the one that drives all the programmatic elements of it. Okay. So we'll have an auditorium Has space. Has that ever been done before? Um, there's been elements of it, but not really. Yeah. I don't think of, there's not really been an opportunity like this where you have 
literally in the heart of the hottest part of the state yeah. in terms of all the economic activity, where the state actually has the ability to say, we're going to pick the most, I mean, just to be honest, it's probably the most expensive part of that real estate, but how absolutely critical it is. What you'll see in other states is, or other innovation districts is they'll have something like this, but it's on the outskirts. There's mm-hmm. nobody there. Nobody's going. Industry's not really utilizing it. There's not a lot of interest in coming to it. By having it right in the heart of that, I think is really going to set the tone for the whole purpose of what the point's supposed to be, this innovation yeah. hub and collaboration space. You may have three professional sports teams there too. I know. I've heard about that. <laughs> I, I'm not on the land side, so I'm actually not in those discussions, but I've been hearing <laughs> about it. <laughs> Utah Jazz, our NHL team, which is, I think, closer than people think. Mm-hmm. And then you've got the Miller family going after a major league baseball team. And I know they want to put it in Salt Lake, but um, you know, also Ryan could own that baseball team. It's not a done deal that the Millers like, and so Ryan could own three um, professional four actually with uh, Real mm-hmm. Salt Lake. And, you know, you look, you go to like the Braves, you go to Atlanta and see like what they've created around that in mm-hmm. this whole entertainment sports district Yeah, and where the jazz are now at the Delta center. Like that's not possible. Yeah. And to have it personally, like I live in Utah County, so I would love to not have to drive all the way to Salt Lake to go to jazz games. Mm-hmm. But um, you look at like if there was a really cool entertainment sports district, there was this innovation district. I think that could be an incredible, incredible development. But yeah. the, the the scary thing about the point of the mountain is like you really can't screw that up. Like you only, <laughs> we only get one shot at that. Right. And it's, it's like a chance in a lifetime. Right. Yeah. And the impact could be you know, generational of what we Yeah, whereas like we, we get to think about it, the state owns it, we get to, you know, be really intentional. Whereas like Lehigh, we weren't intentional at all. Right, right. <laughs> it was just like, yeah, let's put up buildings, you know, state didn't own it, it was all private, all, all that type of stuff. And Lehigh is what it is. I mean, obviously we're in Lehigh and, you know, do a lot of stuff there. But um, man, to actually have a well thought out, executed plan there is... Yeah. Is a big deal. Have you ever thought of like putting, like reaching out to like somebody like N- MIT mm-hmm. or Stanford and saying, "Hey, why don't you put a campus on yeah. this land?" We've we've actually discussed. I mean, we don't necessarily want to bring campuses, but collaboration, partnerships. Yeah. Um, Research. You know, we were in Cambridge uh, not long ago, and we were working closely with them about how we can create collaborations. MIT. We've talked to a number of the the schools. Um, the other thing is just getting our schools working more closely together. There's so much potential there. Uh, that we're just not seeing as much value of that collaborative approach. Yeah. I think our new board of higher education, uh, you know, many of them, mm-hmm. I think is going to do a fantastic job of helping to bring the schools more together. They all bring incredible strengths individually, but to see the collaboration amongst them, I think is going to create a lot of new, exciting things that we can do with the state. But um, yeah, we'll be partnering with other institutions across the country and even internationally, uh, we just are getting a lot of interest when we go out and travel. People think it's so cool that there's this this thing that you can connect all 16 of our public education as well as, you know, we work a lot with BYU as well, um, that you can bring all of them together in a place and and right there in the heart of industry. So yeah. we think there's some really cool things we can do there. It's probably the most interesting piece of real estate in the entire country, actually. Yeah, I think so. Like that, I don't think that's an overstatement either. It's, it's really interesting there. Uh, what else is going on? What, what should our community know? Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, about the future of the state, you know, I mentioned the fund and and some of the things we're working on. I think right now um, Utah is in a unique position. I think a lot of states, we just see this across the country right now, a lot of states haven't done uh, a very good job of managing their resources, their funds. And as the economy is starting to turn, we're seeing it here in Utah already. We're Mm -hmm. already seeing a downturn in, in, uh, in revenue. Um, Utah is a unique opportunity where we can actually capitalize because of where we're at as a state. We've set aside a lot of funding. We've been really smart about how we've spent those dollars. Um, but I think there's going to be a really cool opportunity in the next few years. And that sounds terrible to say, but as other states are really struggling, I think Utah can really hit the gas and, and even stand out more as, as this incredible place to do business and live. Um, as we're thinking about the Olympics, that's a big deal, right? Yeah. We're, 10 years from now is, is the plan for that. So how do we make sure that we're prepared for that and, and, and building the right infrastructure there and so that when we, when we deliver this amazing games, which I hope we do, um, it'll be another great way to highlight uh, what a great state we live in. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much for coming on. Seriously, out of your, you're the busiest man I know <laughs> with, with everything you got going on. And good luck in the session. That comes up, what, were we two weeks out, three weeks uh, out? No, next Tuesday. Oh, <laughs> we're yeah. four days out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's coming fast. <laughs> well, good luck on everything there and really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thanks, man.